pikani atimo ikan ayo nina ayo ichipata piyo is pummokin no kohtokin is pummokin na kohketsik siik skatopin naan seepomapi ayo ichipata piyo no kspummokin naan kzakkuh meita piyo na tuusi no kspummokin naan na piyo sin ah säästy vatsimaan mi sami päätä piisin kamutaan ei Remember our past to build our future. It is said that at the turn of the century our language will become extinct. How do we revitalize our language, our culture? What will it take to keep our identity? How do we come full circle? We need to remember our past, what has happened in the past, in order to build our future. We're, uh, we have a future that is really based on the past, and things that have happened in the past, a lot of them have really never been completed or done. If we don't really look into what has occurred in our past, things like um, our history, historical trauma, where we've gone, that our education means nothing. Because we do our education for those who have gone before us. And so if we don't know what they've been through to make sure and to assure that we had access to education, then we miss our whole meaning. And it's really important as Blackfeet people, as the Pakani people, as Amskapi Pakani, that we recognize it's through our, our elders, it's through our history, makes us who we are today. Otherwise, we're like any other culture. And so it's really important that as we move forward and as we design and as we pursue educational programs, that we keep in mind that there's a history that helps us to move forward, but also a history that may at times keep us stuck because we haven't resolved issues of that history. Most reservations today, including the Blackfeet Reservation, which is the fifth poorest reservation in the United States, it's a victim of poverty. So those issues, drugs, alcohol, domestic violence, trauma, those are products of poverty. We live in an impoverished area that we were forced to live on. Additionally, in that is unresolved trauma. And that's been documented throughout our history. So here we go back to our history. Our history has many things like the Baker Massacre, the death from smallpox, those kinds of um, people didn't realize that we were victims of biomedical warfare when smallpox blankets were given to us and wiped out a lot of our folks. So those things happen. And because those things happen in less period, a 500 year period, the right to heal and grieve and to recover from those things never occurred amongst our people. So today on the Blackfeet Reservation, we have trauma after trauma after trauma. And it's related to drug addiction, car, motor vehicle accidents, violence, all those things. So we recreate that trauma because we haven't resolved it back here. So the process is, is that we got to recognize what are the traumas back here. Go through the pain and honor and suffering of that and then come up here and heal. Only then collectively will we get well. Only then collectively can we move forward as a healthy tribe and a healthy collective force. And so that's problematic. So we have these adages of, of poverty and we have the adages of historical trauma and we're stuck in this big square that we don't know how to get out. And if we start talking about it, if we start recognizing it, 
my spiritual beliefs are that the Amska people Kani have purpose and reason. And that's connected to what our ancestors went through, what they survived in the past. My um, spiritual belief is that every day we walk on this campus, every day we walk on this reservation, we don't walk alone. We have our elders, we have, we have our people who have gone before us. And even though they're not here, they walk with us today. So a lot of why we go through education, a lot of why we choose life the way we choose is not because, oh, we just wanted to do it. It's, it's because somebody close to us has either gone through this and not been able to get through it, and we want to do it for them, or it's because our elders has said that we need to be stronger. We were a warring uh, tribe. We need to be that. But, you know, throughout that, it's our whole connection from this place to the other place and that metaphysical connection. And, and that's not kind of allowed in mainstream culture, but here we allow it, we recognize it, and it becomes of who we are. And it, it's not about what church you go to. It's about who you are and your connection to those have, who have gone before you and your connection to those who have gone before you recently. The reservation is a harsh life, but our spirituality, our connection to who we are and to those who have gone before us helps us to be, remain strong and persevere. <laughs> the spiritual beliefs of the Bikani are, uh, are, are so huge. Uh, uh, to put them into one uh, interview would be, be uh, most impossible. Uh, we have uh, many, many bundles. Uh, a lot of our beliefs are based on some of our stories uh, of uh, Napi and Gatuyas and some of the stories that have been passed down that uh, our elders have uh, uh, had uh, in their uh, vision quests and in their dreams stories that they have passed on to us about uh, how to do things in life, also uh, about medicine, how to deal with, with illnesses and uh, the medicines to make, and also our songs. There, uh, our songs were, uh, uh, many of them were made in a dream, or given in a dream. So the spirituality is very vast and varied. I don't see anybody really, I don't see it being a pr productive on the reservation unless that child or unless that person that is in a certain grade um, going through the Blackfeet language classes, unless they have an actual pride in wanting to learn to Blackfeet. And that, wanting to learn Blackfeet and just learning Blackfeet are two different things to me. So being productive, I think there has to be like a sense of um, pride, Blackfeet pride, a sense of cultural understanding and a sense of being a traditional person. Three months to get on the star, Miss Big C, a seat boy, still a sick seat boy, Kiawania. As an ape, we scarp a sick, scarp a seat boy, I'm scarpy peekani or Matsuapi tapi. One of the best things I was ever told in our schools was from Miss Big C, who's sitting right across from me. She'd always say, I'm Skapi Pikanio, I want me, um, I just went blank now. Mat, Matsuapitapi, which means uh, the Southern Pagan are wonderful people. And everything she would say in the language was positive and reinforcing, reinforcing as opposed to the English, which can be, you know, negative in a lot of ways. But I think as a child hearing that positive reinforcement in a language that means so much more than what we can say in English. And that's one of the biggest things I learned in Cutswood is how being native is a good thing and how it's a positive thing and how it's a powerful thing and how powerful our language is in that sense. You know, I think you also stated that some of them, the hard, the meaner things you could say in language was nothing, you know. Uh, your silence was strong because our words were so powerful, our silence was even stronger. So that's something that I really took a hold of and
carry with me today in my daily life today, you know, and that's something I really appreciate and I'm thankful for. Thankful for you as a teacher. Mm -hmm. Okay, Nisu Nitanaku, Ayaki Tsuniyaki. Hello, my name is Lynn Madplume. I am the 2014 2015 Miss Blackfeet. As far as I know, I think the schools do a good job of teaching like the basics, like numbers, colors, seasons, stuff like that. Um, but I think as adults, it's our responsibility to provide more opportunities at home for kids to experience that. Because I was lucky enough to grow up around grandparents who spoke the language fluently. And, that's, and knew the culture. That's how I learned a lot about it because they spoke to me in the language and if I didn't know what they were saying, they would explain it to me and they would just continue to repeat that to me until I understood what they were saying. Uh, okay, I said, hello, my name is Holy Sun. Um, I am from the Blackfeet Nation and I am semi-fluent in Blackfeet. Um, I, I grew up learning the culture from the time I was born. My dad was very traditional and he, he, he helped me to get immersed in it from a very young age. Um, as for the language, I, didn't, I only knew how to count to seven until I was in fourth grade and then I attended an immersion school where I learned a lot of the basics and a lot of the rules behind the language. And now I'm semi-fluent. And here at the university level, we're just starting to gather that uh, mindset of language revitalization and language involvement. This uh, Native American Studies Department is vast in education such as Native perspectives, Native spirituality, Native history, but we're not giving it from the Native language part of view. We're giving it in a European English form. And I think that doesn't have the full opportunity to benefit students in what Native American culture truly is. It has to start in the home and also be accepted in the school system for language to fully uh, take on and take a hold of the youth. And um, it's a community effort that we all need to work forward to, you know. Well, the culture and the language go hand in hand. Without one, you don't have the other. The language is very, very important in uh, reviving the culture. Uh, when we uh, I do our ceremonies and we yeah, I do our prayers, we need to do them in the Black the Blackfeet language. And uh, uh, the language isn't there, then uh, it's it's pretty hard to uh, uh, have the culture. Uh, it's not so much a uh, need to revive our culture. It is a need for us to follow our culture and to learn more about our culture. The drugs, the domestic abuse, and all the other things that was mentioned are, uh, are there. We need to decide how we're going to deal with them. In the past, that was the job of the grandmothers. The grandmothers took, made sure that was all taken care of. We need to uh, uh, let the people find out more about our culture and about respect. It is primarily uh, caused by a total loss of respect for not only oneself, but for the entire nation of the Pikani. Yo, yo. Uh, learning my language really is what um, gave me an identity in this world. You know, in America, it's hard for Native peoples to identify themselves as Native, or it's hard for us to have an identity because the media strew, strew it so much and everybody kind of falls back on contemporary. But we are native people and our roots are still very strong and the easiest way to understand it is through our language, you know, the language is the base for your culture. So by learning the language, I really was given the opportunity to understand who I was and where I really came from. 
and I know the power of language and how it helped myself and I would encourage everybody to learn their native language because that's really what we need as people to help come full circle in the healing process. To me, being like a traditional person, raised in you know, a traditional cultural sense, in my Blackfeet ways, to me, is it's almost like your tie to everything. Like you have your ties to your land, you have your ties to your ceremony, you have your ties to your family, and that that language is a, you know another tie, and that's how you integrate all of your you know your culture, your Blackfeet culture. That's what I think. Who are we? Who are we as Blackfeet people without our language and culture? Um, some people would say blood quantum, but I disagree with that. That's a government construction, and it was used to assimilate us. And who? How can we call ourselves Blackfeet people if we don't know our language and our culture? So I think I think that both of those are immensely important in making us who we are and allowing us to keep our identities and to stay to stay true to ourselves and true to our ancestors and true to the Creator. Um, well, I know that a lot of Native American languages, and especially ours, are considered endangered, and if we don't preserve them now, then they're going to become extinct, and we won't be able to share the language with our kids and with our kids' as kids. And um, I think that the language is a very big part of who we are, and because of that, it needs to be preserved. There's a certain, there's a, there's a paradigm that comes with speaking Blackfeet that you can't have with other languages, and that's that's true for all Native American languages. I think that when we're looking at revival of our language, because it's so um, near almost, you know, being absolutely gone, the only way I think we can come full circle is what our elders always taught us, is we do this for seven generations to come. And so if we use that as a frame work in today, and this is saying using what they said in the past to today, that would be the focus of, on our little ones. And if you look at the immersion schools that are um, kind of becoming uh, like a wildfire um, pedagogy across the Indian country, that it's through these young children and they're being immersed in the culture and language that challenges the, the middle age folks and the other folks to use their language and it also challenges our elders to remember to use their language that they may have forgot. So it's through our youth and I know that's very rhetorical but it's through our youth and especially our very very young ones that we engage in our language because if they become versed it challenges us to become versed and they become the leaders and that's the whole full circle of language and language immersion and language revitalization. I think we have to make it accessible to younger generations and I think that if that means putting it on things like Facebook or like recording it electronically, uh, making things like pitch art that the Cherokee did with Henrik and Eds, um, I think that programs that would implement things that targeted our youth would be very successful. I just think that that's who we are and what we come from. It's important to know where you come from and your language because if we don't fight to preserve it now, nobody will. And I think people do a good job of saying and knowing the ideas, but it's us up to the individual to take the initiative. I think we count a lot on people. Oh, somebody's doing it. Somebody's taking care of it. And so I think it's important for us as the individual to take responsibility and do it ourselves.